director of the Florida Literacy Coalition. I'm pleased to welcome you today to our webinar on strategies for teaching low beginning English learners. So just a few housekeeping items. Um, please do feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. We'd appreciate that. Um, and uh, we will be um, doing a session evaluation at the end of the session. So please keep an eye on the chat for that. We'd love you if you could take a few minutes at the end of the at the end of the presentation to give us your feedback. That's very important. Uh, there will be opportunities for Q&A. And if you post your questions uh, in the chat, uh, we will be getting to those. And then there'll be an opportunity at the end as well for Q&A, especially if you're interested in sort of vocalizing your questions uh, in person. So um, with that, oh, and I also wanted to do a shout out and thank the Florida Department of Education for their support in making this training possible. So I'm pleased to introduce to you today our presenter, Jennifer Christensen. Jennifer is an English instructor with over 20 years experience working with refugee and immigrant populations. She is also the founder of ABC English, uh, an online collection, extensive collection of resources uh, to teach foundational English language and literacy skills. So welcome, Jennifer. I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm really uh, happy to be here with all of you today. And I want to thank the Florida Literacy Coalition for inviting me to speak to all of you today. And I'm going to be presenting about strategies for teaching low beginning English learners. And first I'll take just a minute to um, introduce myself. I, I've been a full-time teacher within the adult education world for my whole career. Um, I'm at 24 years now. And about half of that time, I've also been a program coordinator of a medium-sized workplace-based literacy program where we served students from literacy level up through intermediate advanced. So I definitely understand the program coordinator aspects of adult education as well. And then in 2012, I began desi designing curriculum and resources to share with other teachers um, I'm the author of several books for students and teachers and a large collection of digital resources that I share at the website ABC English. And I'll be showing you a few of those resources um, throughout the presentation uh, during the next hour or so. And then currently my role with students is as a one-to-one oh. -one reading specialist. Oh. I provide tutoring to adult English learners um, who need um, extra support in learning foundational literacy skills. So I, I'll, I'll also let you know that I am located in Salt Lake City, Utah. This is what our city looks like right now. Um, most of the students that I have worked with during my career are newly resettled refugees in the Salt Lake City area that have come here through either one of these two resettlement programs. The International Rescue Committee or IRC has an office here and Catholic Community Services does as well. So we, I've had students from you know, all over the world that have come through the refugee resettlement program. And we also have a fairly significant Spanish speaking immigrant population here, um, many from Mexico, but also countries all over Central and South America and immigrants from other places as well. So there's a, been a pretty diverse um, group of students that I've worked with over the years. So throughout this presentation, I'm gonna to refer to four different types of English learner students, adult English learners. Um, and I'm gonna use these four uh, stock photos to help explain these different types of students. So I want you to think about um, these four different types of students. And these two students are low beginning in speaking and listening ability. So if you were to ask a simple question in English, um, you may get a one word answer or maybe no answer at all or an uh, incorrect answer. Okay, So these students are at the very, very earliest stages of learning to understand spoken English language. 
Okay, and then in contrast, these two students are a little bit higher. I would put them in the high beginning speaking, listening category, where if you ask them a simple question in English, you'll get several words strung together. They're showing, they're demonstrating, expanding vocabulary and developing grammar. It's probably not quite perfect yet. They're still at the high beginning level, not the intermediate or adv advanced level. Um, so that's how these two students are different from the first two. And then these two students are emergent readers. And what I mean by that is they are not literate in their home language. And let me hide these meeting controls so I can see all of that. So these two students are not literate in their home language. So what that, uh, usually the definition I see is that they have for emergent reader is that the person has had no or little opportunity for formal education in their home language, usually less than six years. So if I were to ask this woman, did you go to school in your home country? Did you go to school in Sudan? She would say no school. Or this student, did you go to school in Somalia? She says never. Um, and in contrast, these two students are literate in their home language which means that they've finished at least a primary education in their home country. So if I ask the same question to this student, did you go to school in Afghanistan? He may say 10 years. This woman, did you go to school in Mexico? And she replies that she went to primary school and secondary school, which in her case would be nine years of total formal education. All right, so I'm thinking about these four types or these four students in terms of both their language ability, uh, which ranges from low beginning up to high beginning, but I'm also thinking about them in terms of their literacy ability and, and their experience with literacy in their home language, which ranges from none up through um, a lot of formal education in their home language. And I just wanna, re uh, again, remind you that all of these students are beginners. All of these students have aspects of being a beginning English learner, um, but they all have very different needs. So these two students need daily intensive systematic instruction in foundational literacy skills, including things like phonics. Um, these two students may need a little bit of phonics instruction to support pronunciation and reading, but they don't need the same kind of intensive systematic instruction that these students need. And then these students who are at the very earliest stages of speaking, they need topic-based language instruction starting with the very most simple vocabulary. And then these students, they still need topic-based language instruction, but they need more complex patterns and vocabulary. So within the realm of teaching beginning, English uh, language learners, it's really pretty, it's really very complex. So the goal of my presentation today is to answer this question. What can teachers and programs do to serve all of these learner types? And I have five suggestions to answer this question. So the first one is to assess for literacy. And it's uh, it's very common in my experience and and, um, I, I know it's becoming common all across the country and even the world that you will see students who have literacy needs within your English learner classrooms. So I think it's really important to keep that in mind and assess for that. So find out if any of your learners have literacy needs. And the first tool that I want to share with you from the ABC English website is uh, screener to help you um, understand what literacy needs your students might have. So this is the ABC English website. And let me just start from the beginning. If you go to abcenglish.com, that's the easiest way to remember to get to the website, abcenglish.com, you'll see that it shortens to this shorter address. Um, but once you're here at the homepage, you can click on this library tab and within the ABC English Library, you'll see 10 different categories of resources. And down here at the bottom, there's a category labeled assessment. And when you open that up, the very first link here is a five minute screening tool. So this is a tool that 
It's a two page tool. I usually keep it printed out and in a plastic sheet protector and just in the, you know, in the drawer of my desk in my office. So whenever I meet a new student, whenever a new student comes in, I can pull this out and use it to get a really quick idea of what the student's language and literacy ability is. So this is a screening tool. It's not a test where you like write down points or keep track of the information to like compare it to another test later. This is simply to get a really quick idea of what a student's um, language ability is and literacy ability is. So on this side of the screening tool, there are some oral questions. It starts with very, very simple questions like what's your name and where are you from? And then you directly ask, did you go to school in your country in how many years? And then after that, these are some more open-ended questions that can help you, depending on how the student answers, that can help you gauge um, if they're at the you know, low beginning level would be one word answers or no answers. High beginning would be stringing some words together, but maybe not quite correct. And then intermediate or advanced would be, you know, you know quite complex answers to those questions. So this helps you screen for their language ability. And then on the other side, we have several reading samples to help you screen for a student's literacy ability. And together with the answer to this question, did you go to school in your country? If the student answers that they went to school fewer than six years in their country, um, that will that should be a light bulb in your brain to keep in mind that they may have literacy needs. They probably will have literacy needs. Okay, so on this side, there's some reading samples. And here uh, I have a video showing a student um, reading through these first reading samples. Let's watch that now. S. Mm-hmm. Good. Hen. Okay. Mom. Okay. Fish. Okay. I don't. Baby meal. That's okay. Mm-hmm. Can I have her? That one's difficult. Okay. Finish. All right. Can you read? Okay. So. It's clear from even just looking at this first line of letters that this student has a need for foundational literacy skills instruction. Um, and I wanna take just a quick moment to explain why you may have noticed that the student said the word hand here and the word mom here. Um, and the reason the student is using that those words, um, this is a student that's been in an English program for a very sh short time and has started to learn for the first time about alphabet letters uh, using this alphabet packet. This alphabet packet is another free resource that I wanted to make sure that you know is available. So again, if you come here to the ABC English website and click here on the library tab, I mentioned those 10 different categories of resources. The very last category, you'll see a link here to the alphabet packet. This is a 25 page packet that helps you as a teacher to um, teach a student who doesn't yet know anything about the alphabet letters or sounds. So um, it does that by introducing a few sounds at a time, a few letters at a time, and then using this technique that's called embedded mnemonics. Embedded mnemonics just means that you're using a memorable uh, image in the shape of a letter to help a student learn a keyword and a sound. Okay, so the student is going to learn that the letter name is H, but the sound is H, like hand. The letter name is G, the sound is G, glasses. F, F, fish. D, D, door. C, C, cup. B, B, baby. So this is group one. There's an opportunity to practice group one. The next day you'd introduce group two and practice that. Group three, then the short vowel sounds, and then put that sound information to work in sounding out a simple word. And this, uh, the words and images have been chosen specifically to be more relatable to an adult English learner um, more relatable to an adult English learner than perhaps like a phonics curriculum that's designed for kids would be. 
Okay, so you can find that alphabet packet here um, at the bottom of the page in the ABC English library. So back to this video. So the student, you may have noticed she said hand here. She said mom here. She, this is the letter T, but she confused it for the letter F. That's why she said fish. This is the letter D, but she confused it for the letter B. That's why she says baby, okay? So anyway, I'm using this five minute literacy screener to get a quick idea of if this student would benefit from some targeted instruction in um, liter foundational literacy skills. Oops, I have one more video example. These right here, S, mm -hmm. H, yeah. M, T, D, R, C. That's easy, what about here? Wow. That's right. Good. One. The bad. Uh-huh. The game. Uh-huh. Uh, rain. Good. Cut. Good. And what about here? He is, he is working the, he is working the, he is he is working. He she Okay, so this one is interesting because the student is really confident in naming these letters in the first sample and struggles a little bit with uh, putting sounds together into syllables. Like I noticed that she uh, this letter is G, but she used the D sound here and also here before she self-corrected. And then she didn't know the short vowel sound here. Um, and then interesting, the, these high frequency words, she gets he is working quite easily, but then she gets to this word and really gets stuck. And that's interesting to me because that exact same word was right here um, and she was able to easily get it, but then doesn't recognize it's the same word here. But anyway, this uh, quick reading sample, for this student, I would have her stop reading here. I don't need her to read these other examples because I have the information that I need, which is that this student would really benefit from getting some targeted literacy instruction. These right here. Okay. So I also wanted to point out that there's another assessment tool called the ABLE test that is also free at the ABC English website. Once again, if you go to the library tab, come down here to assessment, you'll see right here the ABLE test. ABLE stands for Assessment of Basic Literacy for Adult and Adolescent Emergent Readers. So this is an assessment system designed specifically for adult English learners um, or adult emergent readers. Um, it's meant to be used with students who don't have a lot of formal education in their home country. And it'll help you understand what a student already knows or doesn't yet know about uh, basic foundational literacy skills. So within level one, you're testing to see what students already know or don't know about consonant sounds, short vowel sounds, sounding out a short one syllable word, digraphs like C-H-S-H-T-H, E-E-O-O, -O, and some of the most frequent, um, the high frequency words in easy sentences. So I'll just open up the level one score sheet to show you that, what that looks like. This is the score sheet where you as the teacher or um, test administrator would keep track of points. And what the student will see is either this slideshow, if you prefer to use a digital version, you can use a slideshow like this. So the student sees one letter at a time and they respond and you keep track of points. Section two has just one syllable words like this. And then section three has sentences with high frequency words. Okay, there's also a paper booklet option if you prefer that over a slideshow. So here on the score sheet, there's some directions about how to keep the points and you'll keep track of how many points for section one and section two and section three, and then you'll total them together here. And there's some instructions about what that total score um, can let you know as a teacher. So if this total score is less than 80, 
um, it's recommended that that or it that lets you know that this student would benefit from learning from these level one phonics slideshows. So the level one phonics slideshows are here in this category at the top. You'll see level one, level two, level three, and level four. The level one slideshows cover things like consonant sounds and short vowel sounds and sounding out a one syllable word and learning about CH, SH, TH. Um, and then obviously if the assessment shows that the student knows all of those things, you'd move on to the level two um, assessment and lessons. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. All right, so my first recommendation to answer this question about what can teachers and programs do to serve all different kinds of beginning learners is to make sure you're assessing for literacy and uh, make sure that you know which students, um, if, if any of your learners have literacy needs. Okay, and my second suggestion is about grouping. And I hope that you'll consider both literacy and language when you're grouping students. So, in an ideal situation, <clears throat> you would think about a student's literacy from low through high, excuse me, and their language ability from low beginning through high beginning and place them into four different groups like this. And let me give them some labels. So I've labeled this type of student emergent reader one. An emergent reader one student is a student who doesn't have formal education in their home language and they're also at the low beginning uh, language level speaking ability. Emergent reader two means that they don't have um, formal education in their home language, but they do uh, speak a lot better. So you may be able to have quite a good spoken conversation with the student, but the student still needs that literacy assistance. And then I've labeled these two learners ELL1 and ELL2. ELL stands for English language learner. And I've chosen those um, labels just because these, these are um, perhaps the more typical types of students that um, programs are kind of used to serving and big publishers are used to writing curriculum for. There's an assumption made that students have some literacy in their home language um, when, they're, uh, when they arrive at an English program. Okay, so when you're thinking about grouping students, option one, and perhaps the most ideal option, is that you would have four separate groups with four rooms and four teachers to really um, meet the exact needs of each type of student. And for a larger program with you know, more capacity and more staff and rooms and space, um, that may be possible. But many smaller programs, um, <coughs> excuse me, many smaller programs might not have that capacity. So another option would be to have two separate groups with a split focus. So that would mean during your first hour of instruction, you'd put these types of students together and these types of students together in a different room and have a literacy focus for the lesson. And then during the second hour, some students would need to switch to a different teacher in a different room and you'd have a speaking, listening or language focus. Um, and you put these two types of students together and these two types of students together. So this is an option that requires two rooms and two teachers and might be more um, appropriate for a smaller program. Another option to consider is the use of reading specialists. So employing a specific staff person or training some specific volunteers um, to provide uh, tutoring and <clears throat> support that's very specific to foundational literacy skills. And I, I would recommend that if um, you are going that direction to make sure that each student receives tutoring several times a week for you know, at least 30 or 40 minutes. Um, without that kind of intensity, um, it's difficult to really help the student move uh, you know, improve in foundational literacy skills. It's something that takes, you know, several times of practice per week to really see a difference. And then option four is to think about the idea of using learning stations. This would be where you have one big room with a lead teacher and volunteers, 
and the students rotate to different um, learning stations. And I may have time at the end of this presentation to describe that more uh, in detail, but if I don't, there's a link right here that you can uh, go read about that option. And I'll be sharing the link to this whole uh, slideshow at the end of the presentation as well. So uh, last thought is it's very difficult to try to meet all of these needs in a large group in one room with one teacher. So if you have this type of student and this type of student and this type of student and this type of student, and it's just you, just, just one teacher in the room, it's hard to keep students happy and it's really hard to be happy as a teacher. Like it's really hard to do that well. So I would, um, that's why I'm asking you to really think about both literacy and language when you're grouping students. And if you have a role in program leadership or a voice in the way that your program is structured, I think grouping is actually a really great opportunity for strong program leadership and just a, a way to think about, uh, it can be a very effective way to increase the effectiveness of your uh, program. Okay, the third suggestion I have is about lesson planning. And this is similar in that I'm asking you to consider both literacy and language when you're planning lessons. So if you have students who have literacy uh, needs, um, I want to make sure, I, I want to suggest that you're really thinking about that within your lesson planning. So when you're lesson planning, the key word for literacy instruction is systematic. The keyword for language lessons is topic-based. So I'll show you what I mean by that. So with a literacy lesson, you want it to be systematic, meaning that it's based on assessment. So for example, you use that ABLE test to get a sense of what a student already knows or doesn't yet know about uh, letters and letter sounds and phonics patterns and um, reading. And then based on that assessment, you use lessons that uh, you, that's how you choose the lessons. So there's a, a scope and sequence which starts at the simplest and goes step by step through all of the things students need to learn and you use the assessment to decide where to start. On the other hand, language lessons are topic-based. You want them to be, um, relevant to your students. So you're choosing topics that are relevant to your students, you're using authentic language, and you're practicing that in things like role plays and vocabulary activities. So one classic example is doing a, a unit or, you know, a week's worth of lessons about health, going to the doctor, talking about common health problems like, um, you know, cough or sore throat. So that is an example of a language lesson. <clears throat> so this type of student needs a high dose of literacy every day and a big dose of language every day. And this student's a little bit different because the student's speaking and listening is already um, high in, in comparison to her literacy level it would make sense to spend more of your instructional time on a literacy focus and a little bit less on a language focus. And then these two students, they've already got that literacy experience in their home language. So it would make, uh, they, they don't need daily intensive phonics instruction. Um, their main concern is developing language. Um, and I'll just point out again at this, link to the ABC English online library within all these 10 different categories. I already showed you the, the systematic phonics lessons. That's obviously the literacy lessons. And then all of these other categories fall into that language category. So for example, in the vocabulary um, category, you'll find lesson slideshows to teach about health problems or house problems or the school system or jobs or food or shopping. Okay, these are examples of topic-based uh, language lessons. Okay, my suggestion, suggestion number four is uh, literacy training. So if you have students within your program that need 
literacy instruction, um, I would suggest that you seek training in how to teach foundational literacy skills. And learning how to teach foundational literacy skills is often something that's not included in a, like a TESOL certificate or the kind of classic training programs for English language instructors. So you kind of have to go looking for specifically how to teach phonics and reading and foundational literacy skills. And I, I do, um, I have seen that that's a big gap in what's available to our um, profession. So that's one project that I've actually been working on currently is creating some teacher training modules to help teachers understand how to teach foundational literacy skills specifically to adult English learners. So this again is at the ABC English library in the training category. These are brand new. I just put them out within the last month. The teacher training modules include video examples of instructional techniques, as well as a lot of background information from research. And then every teacher training module has a course notes document, as well as a certificate of completion. So this, uh, is helpful if you happen to be a manager of teachers or volunteers, you can ask your teachers to fill out the course notes and get the certificate to um, show evidence that they've completed the training. And these teacher training modules are free. They can be used for teacher self-study. They they're self-paced online modules, or you could use them as the basis for your own group training and discussion. So right now, teaching level one phonics is available, teaching level two phonics is available, and these two are coming soon. And here, I wanted to show you a handful of video samples from these teacher training modules. Um, this one is about teaching short vowel sounds. And I've, I've had a number of teachers get back to me and tell them that this has been one of the most helpful things they've learned. So if you've zoned out, this is a good time to zone back in because I think this is a, a useful thing for all um, beginning English teachers to know this is a good trick or technique. So I'll start by uh, pointing out, you may not have thought about this before, but English actually has up to 21 distinct vowel sounds. And that's pretty unique because a lot of other languages don't have that many different uh, vowel sounds. So for example, a Spanish speaker or in the Spanish language, there are only five vowel sounds, a, a, e, o, u. But in English, we have up to 20 vowel sounds. We've got a, e, i, o, u, a, 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 o, let's see, ow, oi, er, ar, or, and there's more, I'm not gonna be able to list them all off right here in front of you. But the point is some of the sounds in English may not exist in the home language that your students speak. So that's why it's pretty tricky for them to get all those sounds down. So this is a video that shows how you can help students learn about the short vowel sounds. And I'll just play that for you here. All right, so these are some ways that we can remember the short vowel sounds. This yeah. sound is ah, okay? Ah is down in the, you make, you make your chin go down, ah. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna go down for ah, ah. Okay. All right, the next, the next hand symbol is for eh. Eh is forward, eh. Yeah. When you make the sound in your mouth, it's more forward, eh. Okay. Uh, this one is eh, like inside, so it's up. Eh, 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 okay. And then this one is ah, uh, like October. Ah uh, is in the back of your mouth with a round sound. Ah, uh, sorry, ah, uh, okay. uh, October. And then the last one is ah, uh, like umbrella. The sound ah uh, comes forward, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, okay. So I'm gonna make the sound, I'm gonna make my mouth uh, a, into a shape and a hand symbol, but I'm gonna be quiet. I want you to tell me the sound, okay? What is this? Uh, yeah, good, okay, what is this? Eh. 
Yeah, it's eh. Yeah. Good. Okay. Eh. What is this? E. That's e. right. Yeah. E. Good. E. What is this? Oh. You got it. Okay. And what is this? Uh, ah. Nice job. Really, really good. Okay. Uh, okay. And I have one more similar video that I think is worth watching as well. So let's look at that. I'm practicing ah, which is like down, ah, ah, ah. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. And eh, which is like forward. Eh, eh, eh. Eh, eh, eh. Eh, which is up. Eh, eh, eh. Eh, eh, eh. And ah, uh, which is in the middle. Ah. Uh. And then ah uh, is like ah. Uh. Ah. Uh. Good. Okay. So let's do it again. One more time. So ah. Uh. Ah. Uh. Eh. 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 Ah, 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 ah. Good. Okay. So let's use those um, hand motions to help read here. So you tell me what is this one, and then what is this one, and then go back and forth and back and forth. Ah, uh, e, ah, e, ah, e. Okay. Pretty good. So we have ah, e, ah, e, ah. E. Yeah, good. Okay. Try this one. Ah, uh, e, ah, uh, e, ah, uh, e. Yeah, okay. That's pretty good. So, ah, uh, e, ah, uh, e, ah, e. Uh, e. Good. Okay. Uh, how about these? Try these. Oh, ah. Uh, yeah, be careful with this one. So, uh, the name of the letter is O, but the short sound is different. It's ah, uh, like ah, uh, uh, like October. Good. Yeah. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, uh, yeah, they're just. Ah. Uh, yeah, so ah. Uh, October. Ah. 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 Oh. You the differences. Yeah. You. Ah. Yes, different. Yeah, so you tell me. Uh, yes, as different. Ah, uh, is uh, a sound. Mm -hmm. mm, a slow. Ah, uh, as a yeah. uh, uh, sound is outside is long. Uh, yeah, they're different sounds. So this is. Uh, yeah. Uh, That's uh, different. Yes. Uh, uh, there are two different sounds. So. Uh. You Okay, anyway, I love that the student is clearly getting it there. That's fun. So once again, that's an example from the teacher training modules. These teacher training modules are to help teachers become more confident in teaching foundational literacy skills. Um, I showed you the example of short vowel sounds. And let's also look at this example about the use of controlled text. Um, controlled text is also known as decodable text. <clears throat> it's a specific type of text, meaning stories or sentences or phrases, that's written with words that a student already knows how to independently sound out. So if your student is at the very earliest stages of learning to read, um, it's going to consist mostly of these um, three sound words, two or three sound words with short vowel sounds. And it's purposely going to avoid including words with more difficult phonics patterns. So here, let's watch. Wait, the read the story again. So here's the first, uh, the title. The first line is the title. Kid, dead, good. A kid, and then the kid and the bed. The kid is in his bed. The kid is not in his bed. Excellent. Okay, and okay, read the story. Sorry, the, the important thing to know about controlled text is it's used only for a very short phase in the earliest stages of reading instruction. You can think of it as like training wheels. So you use it for a short time and then and then you don't use it anymore. Um, you don't use it anymore because this is not authentic language. It's way, it's, you know, our regular speaking and 
listening language is much more complex than this type of uh, text. So controlled text has a specific purpose. It's to give a chance. Uh, it's to give students a chance to practice decoding skills that they've learned so far, situated in meaningful text, and it builds independent reading ability. So even though the text might seem really uninteresting to you as the teacher, it can be very motivating for a student to read an entire text on their own and understand exactly how to read every word with their newly developed decoding skills. Um, and in contrast, if you have students read non-controlled text, they're gonna encounter a lot of words that they don't yet have the skills to independently read. And instead, they'll have to guess the word, skip the word, or rely on someone else to read the word for them. And those are all strategies that develop poor reading habits. So controlled text is a very useful tool to use in the very earliest stages of teaching um, a student who is not literate in their home language and they're, first, they're learning for the first time how to read in English. Okay, I also want to show you an example of introducing the ing ending so here's another video <clears throat> the word is fishing what's the base word the base word is fish. like the first part you're right okay fish is correct and then here it says what's the ending fishing a ing you are correct good job all right so let's now say fishing again and break it into two syllables a shing Perfect. Perfect. Fishing. That's correct. So we have two syllables, fishing. Okay. So the first syllable is like this. Fe. Mm -hmm. And the next syllable has sh together with ing. Can you read those syllables again? Fishing. Fishing. Got it. Okay. So we have two parts. Fishing. Mm -hmm. Okay. In your notebook. The word is fishing. Okay, so this is a phonological awareness activity, and that just means you're helping the student to be aware of sounds within words or sound chunks within words. So the student first is identifying a base word and an ending, and then they're splitting it into syllables. And it, what's really interesting is that when you ask a student to say the word fishing and break it into two syllables or clap the syllables, they're going to say fishing, okay, even though... So they're probably going to verbalize it like this in like spoken, breaking it up into spoken syllables. They're probably going to say fishing, even though you may have expected them to say it like this, fishing. And there's actually a linguistic reason for that. It's called the maximal onset rule. And that's just a little bit of nerdy linguistics to um, share with you. So maximal means the most. Onset means consonants at the beginning of a syllable. So this SH sound is a consonant, and it's more natural for us when we're speaking to put those consonants at the beginning of syllables. So that's why you're gonna hear a student say fishing. And within the lessons, um, you'll notice that we're using a speech to print approach. So first we're talking about a word and what it means, Next, we're thinking about how to break it up into parts. And then after that, we're seeing how the letters relate to the sounds. So here's one more example. The woman had Same. food. She's going to sell to this guy. Exactly. Sell. Selling. So the word is selling. 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 What is the base word in selling? Sell. You are correct. Okay. What's the ending in selling? Mm. Say it again. Mm. Try it again. Say ing. Ing. That's correct. Yeah, we have ing. This is a very, very common ending in English. So many words um, have the last syllable ing. Mm -hmm. Good job. Can you say the word again and break it into two syllables? Selling. Selling. Got it. Okay, so here's selling. Mm -hmm. mm. So we put the o together with ing. Selling. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Read it again. Selling. Yeah. So read the two syllables. Selling. Yeah, nice job. All right. Can you write that in your notebook? Okay. 
Okay, so once again, this is an example from those teacher training modules. So if you want to come back and be able to see any of those videos or read more about some of these techniques, you can do that within the teacher training modules. Um, I think we have time to do a couple more. So let's also look at this example of compound words. Um, within level one, uh, you want to, of course, teach students all of the letters and the common sounds that they make and how to combine sounds to make one syllable words. But it's also recommended that you start helping students learn how to tackle bigger words pretty early on. And one of the best ways to do that is with compound words. And the way that you can do that is help students learn to look for the vowels Step one is look for the vowels. Step two is split between the vowels. Step three is read each part separately and then read the parts together. So this is what it looks like. This is a word that's big enough that it would probably be pretty overwhelming to a level one, um, a student within the level one uh, range of foundational literacy skills development. Uh, so I would help the student identify the vowels. Then we're gonna split between the vowels we're gonna read this syllable by itself and then read this syllable by itself and then put the syllables together to get to the word. Um, and then this training goes on to share a sample teacher script to help you, you know, coach that a little bit more if the student is struggling. Okay, this is a word sort activity. Here's another video of a student working through a word sort activity. This is a lesson where the goal is for the students to learn this new pattern, A-Y and I-G-H. Uh, this video is about the A-Y segment of the lesson. So when you have only one letter like this, the sound is A, apple, okay? When you have these two letters together, it's a different sound, A, okay? okay. I want you to look and tell me if it's group one or group two. So for example, does this word have a apple or does it have two letters a? Does it have group one or group two? Mm -hmm. Is it like group one or group two? Group one. So group one is not correct. Ah, oh, for sound, oh, a and group two. Yeah, so it's because it has these two letters, which is the same here. Yeah. Okay, so this one belongs in group two. So now look at this one. Does this word belong in group one or group two? Group one. Yeah, that's correct. What about here? Group one. <laughs> group two. Mm -hmm. mm, group two. Yes. Group one. Yes. Mm, group two. No, so one. Yeah, this only has that one letter, group one. Yeah, this one, group two. Yeah, you got it. Okay, so in this group, there's one letter like this. Yes. The sound is a ah, apple. Okay, can you read this word with a? Ah? Oh, cat. Uh, cash. Yes. Mm, but. Yep. Mm, Plus. Very good reading. Okay, so now read everything here with the A sound. Okay, so it's different. It's not a apple, it's different. A Together, the sound is A. a say, day, play, pay. Okay, great. So you'll notice that at the beginning of that activity that it was actually pretty tricky for the student because um, actually all of these letters have the same letter A in the middle. And so this activity helps the student understand that if the letter A is in this vowel team, it represents a different sound and a different type of word. All right, uh, let's also look at this vowel chart activity. This is a cumulative review activity, a short review activity at the beginning of many of the lessons where um, students are simply reviewing a vowel chart of all of the sounds they've learned so far. Now tell me the letter names. What is the name of this letter? A, E, I, O, U. Excellent, okay. And can you tell me what is the sound when you see these two letters together? A, 
Mm -hmm. What about these two letters? A. That's correct. What about these two letters? A. Good. Those all have the same sound. A, A, A. Okay. Mm -hmm. When you see these two letters, what's the sound? E. Mm -hmm. E. E. That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, but I like so, I. Yeah. I is the sound of these three letters. And you're correct. The word right has this pattern inside it. So when you see these three letters, the sound is I. It's the same as this letter name, I. Okay. When you see these two letters, what's the sound? I. I. Correct. Good. These two letters, what's the sound? O. Mm -hmm. O. Good job. When you see these two letters, what is the sound? O. You're correct. Good. O. Uh, mm-hmm. O. And you can say ooh or you, that's correct. Okay, nice job, really. Okay, so as I mentioned, this is a way to do a cumulative review of all of the patterns the students have learned um, up this far or so far. Um, this is about halfway through the level two phonics lessons where the students have learned that many patterns. And this last example, is about teaching the very beginnings of fluency. So fluency just means that you're um, reading with an appropriate speed and expression. And when brand new readers uh, begin to read, they tend to read in a very halting way, like I need a trap, and they give the same amount of time and emphasis to every single word. But um, in order to be able to understand what you're reading, you need to learn to um, put words together in chunks and read with more rhythm and take a break at the end of every sentence. So in a past lesson, the student had already learned about taking a small break at the end of each sentence. So the student's doing okay with that. And here I'm trying to teach the student to chunk phrases together, just two word phrases together, especially the word a uh, or the. So instead of saying a uh, trap, I want the student to say a uh, trap. Okay, so let's watch this video. I need a trap. Yeah, good, okay, that word is trap. Trap. Read it again, and this time try to read it faster. Oh, I need a trap. Good. So sometimes one way to make things faster is if you put words together. So say, I need. So these two go together. I need. I need. Trap. Yeah. So when we say this word, we put it together. A trap. I need a trap. Need trap. Yeah. So listen, I need a trap. I need a trap. You got it. Okay. I will. Go to the store to get a trap. Nice reading. Okay, this time I want you to read it faster. Put this word together with this one. So you're going to say the store, the store. I will go to the store nice. to get a trap. Yeah, and then these two go together, a uh, trap. A trap. Nice. Okay, read this one. I will catch, catch, catch the mouse. Good, okay, put these together, the mouse. The mouse. I will, I will catch, catch the mouse. Nice job. Get out of my house, mouse. Nice job. Okay, read that again. Get out of my house, mouse. Good job. Okay, read the whole story. A mouse. We won't take time to listen to it again, but that's an example of teaching some of the uh, earliest skills within fluency. So just as a reminder, all of these videos um, together with related information, background information for teachers are available within these teacher training modules.
And those teacher training modules are located within the ABC English Library here at the teacher training category. All right, I have just one more. Okay, so my fourth suggestion was about literacy specific training. So if you find that you have students within your program that don't have um, a lot of formal education in their home language, I hope that you'll help yourself and your staff learn some specific skills about how to teach foundational literacy skills. And my last suggestion is uh, to think about um, curriculum and to invest in curriculum. And I, I mean, not only, you know, that might mean investing money, but it also means just investing some time and thought and effort into finding curriculum that's really a good fit for your students. Um, here's a quote about curriculum. It says, studies have shown that the effect of a high quality curriculum on student outcomes can be as strong as the effect of having a veteran rather than a novice teacher. Okay, so especially if you have novice teachers or volunteers in your program that don't have a lot of experience with this type of teaching, one of the best things that you can do to help those novice teachers or um, volunteers is to provide them with a high quality curriculum as a base. Um, this says that curriculum reduces teacher anxiety, lightens teachers' workload, and brings coherence to the whole educational endeavor. And later it says that an education system that doesn't include coherent curriculum is like a car without a working engine. And I think that's a really memorable image. It's like a car without a working engine if you have a program that doesn't include a coherent curriculum. And one interesting personal thing about me is I'm married to a guy who loves a good car project. So here's um, my husband inside of this truck that is missing its engine at the moment. And this is a shiny, good looking truck, but obviously it's not gonna take people anywhere until it's got a working, uh, good quality engine inside of it. So I like that um, idea that an education system that doesn't include coherent curriculum is like a car without a working engine. Um, and both of those previous two quotes that I just shared are in reference to the K-12 education setting but I still think there's value in considering the same within our work with adult English learners. And I've experienced that both as a teacher and as a program coordinator. And I've seen how effective it can be to supply teachers with high quality curriculum resources, rather than asking them to take that on as, a, as their own responsibility. Um, it can really help a new teacher or a very experienced teacher to at least have a curriculum as a jumping off point for what to teach within their class time. So I would suggest that one important role of a program administrator is to research curriculum resources to find the right fit for each type of student within the program and provide curriculum resources and curriculum specific training to teachers. Okay, so I know in almost all of this presentation, I've really heavily focused on these types of students asking you to really find out if you have literacy learners within your program and learn how to um, teach foundational literacy skills. Um, but also overall, I just I hope that you'll think um, with more nuance, I guess, about the different language and literacy needs of beginning type students. And um, even for students who are literate in their native language, it's still, uh, there's still a set of things that these students need to learn that are specific to English. So for example, even though this woman is very literate in Spanish, if she applies the rules of reading Spanish to these words over here, she would say da te or ti me or so up or why or no te book. Okay, so um, by teaching the specific um, literacy, the skills or not skills, but the patterns, the phonics patterns that are unique to English, you're going to help uh, also your literate learners know how to pronounce and appropriately read um, in English. Okay. So speaking of uh, curriculum, the ABC English resources are really designed with this type of student in mind that has fewer than six years of education in their home country. There's a series of phonics lessons as well as 
some lesson slideshows to help you teach topic-based language. The resources can also be useful for these types of students, but I would uh, usually recommend that you use them as a supplement to um, a more robust curriculum for literate learners. Some of the really common ones that you may know of are like things such as Ventures or Standout or Intercumbio or Burlington, Side by Side, English Unlocked. Um, you probably have some favorites. I, if, if you don't know about these, I've put some links here that you can check them out. Um, I also think it's really useful to just like network and find out what other similar programs uh, may be using and talk to their teachers and programs to see what they think about how a curriculum fits with their specific learner. By the way, I would, I would say there's some really strong things about any of these curriculum uh, resources, uh, but all of these one, two, three, four, five, six here have really been designed with this type of learner in mind. So if you're using these six with this type of student, you really have to do some adapting. Um, and that could be a whole additional webinar. Um, so something to keep in mind with curriculum. So this presentation, the overall question that we've been trying to answer is what can teachers and programs do to serve all of these different learner types, the, all of these different types of beginning adult, beginning English learners. Okay. And I have five recommendations that I've gone over. The first is to assess for literacy. So you understand which students have literacy needs. And then within grouping and lesson planning, I hope you're thinking about both language skills and literacy skills. If you have students with literacy needs, I hope you'll seek training that's specific to that. And then to really put some effort into thinking about how your curriculum fits your specific group of students. All right, we are coming up to the end of our time here. And I just wanted to end by saying thank you to teachers. Um, I have been a teacher, I am a teacher. I understand that good teaching requires hard work. It is not an easy thing to do this well. Um, and taking an hour of your time for professional development. I, I, I know that if you're seeking out professional development that um, is relevant to the type of student that you're working with, it really can lead to better student outcomes. So I wanted to thank you for spending your time here for an hour. Um, I do think that teachers are amazing people. So I've got a uh, 10 ish minutes to answer any questions if you have any, and I will open up the chat or maybe Greg or Stephanie, you can help with question asking. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Jennifer. That was very informative. Um, please post your questions, or if you feel free, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question. We don't okay. have any in the chat at this point. Let me give you. Go ahead, Danny. Um, so I, I work at a nonprofit organization called Neighborhood Centers for Families. I also work at some private English schools in Orlando. Uh, I'm 30 years old. I've been doing this for six years now. Um, so many of these places only want the teacher to speak in English, and I respect that policy, and the students are only supposed to speak in English too. But what happens is that the basic level students, some or many of them know literally nothing in English. Uh -huh. so they don't know the words. So they, they speak to me in Spanish or Portuguese because they just don't know anything. Um, so when I, I try to explain as simple as possible, but they still don't understand me, even when I'm using pictures and whatnot. So I ask an advanced level student to help me translate. Is that a weak, a weak teaching strategy or not really? Not everyone in the class speaks Spanish or Portuguese. I've got some people from... Um, Russia, Ukraine, Venezuela, not not everyone speaks Spanish. You see my point? I just don't know what to do because some of them just know like nothing. Also, some of these institutions throw people into the classroom at the last minute. Does that make sense? Yeah, it totally makes sense. I've been there. Okay, so I have a couple of answers. One is that there's a lot of like talk within the in, in the teaching community um, about the word translanguaging. And that just means that you're using all of your language resources. You want to use all of the students' language resources to help them learn their next language. So there is um, a lot of like support for using a, a student's home language in teaching. 
Um, so I don't think it's appropriate for programs to completely ban a home language from the classroom. Um, however, I do think it's also very, very important to be inclusive of your whole class. Like I've had I many times over my career, I've had students come to me when I was in an admi administrator role and maybe they're the one, um, you know, you, usually they're coming to me from other programs and they're saying, well, I went to this other program for a year and I was in the level one class, but I speak Swahili and all of the other students spoke Spanish and the teacher just spoke Spanish to all those other students for the whole year and I didn't learn anything. And that's obviously not fair at all to your right. Spanish speaking students. So I would um, limit it. I would ask, um, you know, there's a few things you can do. You can, you know, as an aside, share one word, you know, a key word that might help them understand um, rather than having a whole conversation in Spanish. Um, some of the tech, you know, I've, in my career, I've almost always taught very, very mixed level classes. So there's not really a main language to, um, that the students all share. So I've had to rely on English. So the main things that you can do to uh, teach that is lots of like actions and photos. So starting, right. starting with actions and photos and then pattern sentences. So use the choose a grammar pattern sentence and kind of use it over and over again. Um, if you wanna look at the ABC English uh, library in the vocabulary category, you'll kind of see some um, strategies for uh, uh, using images and then also pattern sentences. Uh, so, so that's a variety of ideas there. I would say don't ban the home language from your classroom, but also use it sparingly and make sure you're not excluding any students. So I know, like I only speak English, but some of the students they just don't understand to help each other out, they translate. But again, not everyone in my class speaks Spanish and not everyone speaks Portuguese. It's like this at multiple places in Orlando. So I just don't know what to do. You see, it's it's mostly in beginning level classes. Yeah. Yeah, so if you, I, I would say that's totally fine if students are helping each other by making a quick explanation. You don't want it to take over your classroom though, right? And then right. Also, if the language does exist on something like Google Translate, you can teach students to use those tools on their own, on their phone. I mean, the main thing to keep in mind is learning a language takes a lot of time and you know a lot of practice. So there, there will be, uh, you know, a to see progress, it's going to take months and years, not not days or hours, right? So, um, thank you. Yeah, I hope those ideas help. Yes, they do. Uh, Jennifer, I think uh, at least a few folks, or at least one person said that the Google Preview you have to request access, and I I got the same when I came in, so I'm not sure if that's. Okay, maybe that's. Let's see. I just need to. Are you resolving it. that as we speak? Anyone with the link? Yeah, that's there. You go. Uh, I can't see that because the videos are in the way. That's why. Okay. All right. That should work now. Okay. Good. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, other questions. Um, I'm not seeing any here. Actually, I had a question. The ABLE assessment uh, that you mentioned earlier, do you feel that that's only appropriate as a placement tool, or do you feel that it could be used as sort of a, a basic um, pre and post assessment? So the important thing to know about the ABLE test is it's specific to foundational literacy skills. Right. So yeah. not a reading comprehension test. It basically has nothing to do with language. Um, so it it is not a good choice to be the only assessment that you use in a program. Um, but I think it's a great supplemental um, assessment if you have students who don't have home language literacy skills. And yes, it can be used as a, to establish a baseline and then give, you know, a few months later to measure progress and when you're measuring progress, it'll help you know if the student's ready to go to the level two lessons or remain in the level one phonics lessons. So it is designed to be 
used as a diagnostic tool and then also a progress monitoring tool. Okay, very good. Any other questions? I don't know if this is appropriate to say this here. Um, I work for some private English schools. We need more teachers. So if you're interested, please feel free to connect with me. Some jobs are online. Some jobs are in person. Uh, they're in Orlando. They're also online. So please feel free to connect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there was a question as to whether this recording is, is being recorded, and it is, and will be available on our website. Give us a few days to get that posted. Um, any other questions before we adjourn? Thank you. Okay. It doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, very good. Well, thanks again, Jennifer. Lots of great information. Wonderful website you have there with ABC English. We really appreciate your, your sharing all, all these good strategies and resources with us this afternoon. Yeah, you're welcome. I'm glad to have spent some time with you and good luck to all of you in Florida. I appreciate Thank you that. Thank so very much, Jennifer. Thank you. You're welcome. And please, Thank you. and please do take a couple minutes to this. The um, session evaluation is in the chat. So please do take a couple minutes to uh, click on that and answer those questions. We appreciate it. Okay, very good. Well, thanks a lot, everyone. You have a good afternoon. You too. Okay, bye now.